Last week we talked about the millennial kingdom. This week we talk about the rapture. And I mentioned that these two topics are the ones that bring about the most debate on the topics of the end time. So you can see the scripture there I'd like us to read this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read about this event that we so often call the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we'll be reading from verses 15 to 18. While you're churning there, I just want to tell you a little story. This guy looks a little bit frightening. Um, Some would say he was, actually. This is a man named John Darby. He, along with some other young men in the early 1800s, young men who lived in uh, the United Kingdom, both in Ireland and in England, became quite disillusioned with the Church of England. Uh, The fact that the Church of England uh, had become uh, very traditional, uh, that it was, they felt, straying away from biblical truth. It wasn't practicing the simplicity of of following Christ and worshiping Christ, and it it wasn't seeking to interpret the Word of God in literal and clear ways. And so these men became very disillusioned, and they began to gather together in groups, and it wasn't just men, there were women as well, uh, groups that were simply wanting to learn the Bible together, they wanted to remember the Lord together, they did so by sharing communion, and this movement became what we know as the Plymouth Brethren. In fact, that is our history, that is where this church came from. About a hundred years after John Darby and some of the others uh, were founding this movement, this building, some of, anyone know what this building is? Some of you should know what it is. This is the Hawksville Gospel Hall uh, that uh, was started just down the road here in Hawksville. Uh, And it was a a group of believers who very much uh, loved the um, emphasis that John Darby and others uh, like Mueller had uh, brought in terms of worshiping and gathering as believers. And so in, I think it was around 1930, the Hawksville Gospel Hall was started. In the 1960s, uh, I mean, I better, I talk like I know all this history. When was this building built? Was it the 60s? 60s, 60s, right. So in the 1960s, Hawksville Gospel Hall moved here and became Wallenstein Bible Chapel. Uh, I once heard a Canadian historian, a a man who is very big in church history, describing the growth of Christianity here in Ontario. And he said this, that the Plymouth Brethren uh, far, um, how can I say this well? Plymouth Brethren were very impactful in the spread of the gospel. And he said, "We, we far outweighed our size in terms of our numbers but there was a huge impact. And one of the reasons was that the Plymouth Brethren wanted to make Jesus known and they wanted to spread the news and they wanted to plant new uh, assemblies as they would have called them. And that is our history here. Now, sadly, not many decades after this whole movement began, the movement split. And this man, John Darby, became known as the father of the closed brethren. That doesn't actually sound very inviting, does it? But there's a segment of the brethren movement that became closed in the sense that there was less emphasis on wanting to gather all believers together in the name of Jesus. And these groups became more exclusive. Uh, I had a lady uh, came to me a number of years ago who was traveling with her husband out in Newfoundland. And uh, it was a Sunday, and they were looking for a church, and they happened to find one of these more exclusive places. They recognized it as a, a brethren assembly, and so they went. But they were met at the door. They weren't allowed to come in and share communion with the rest of the church family. They had to sit in the back. And this woman was in tears, and I, I think she actually left. She was so shocked, not being familiar with this kind of thing. And certainly that wasn't what her experience had been because she had been part of what we know as the open brother and like Wallenstein Bible Chapel. So there was a big split and uh, John Darby took uh, a number of these assemblies in one direction. We would call it more of a closed direction. And then others like George Mueller, who's famous as a man of prayer, who started a number of orphanages. And there were other men like him who uh, took another group in a direction that became 
the precursor for Wallenstein Bible Chapel and many other assemblies. That started in the United Kingdom. We're here today because those people loved missions. And they came to North America, and they went, they came to Canada, and they went to the United States. In fact, uh, some of the earliest missionaries out of Europe were part of this movement, men like Anthony Norris Groves. I personally am very proud, if I can say that, because I've grown up in this movement. I'm very excited about what God has done. In fact, many churches beyond the Brethren denomination have taken hold of things like the plurality of leadership. Many churches who used to just have a pastor who was the leader of the church and who was in charge have now moved towards having teams of elders. That's an emphasis that the brethren brought about. Churches who used to do communion maybe four times a year or two times a year have moved towards doing communion much more regularly or even weekly as we have been prone to do here. That is a emphasis that our brother and heritage has brought, not just to our churches, but across the whole Christian world. We have a lot to be grateful for. John Darby, along with being the father of what we know as the Close Brethren, is also the father of a movement that we would call, or an idea that we would call dispensationalism. And that's a, an idea or a, an understanding of theology that continues to this day and has been very popular in churches like Wallenstein Bible Chapel. And along with this idea of dispensationalism is something called the pre-tribulation rapture, which has been taught here and uh, understood here. It, it was something that wasn't just taught among the closed brethren, it's been taught among the open brethren for generations. So I want us to talk about the rapture today, but I thought it would be helpful just to take a few minutes to think about the history of these things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is one of the beautiful scriptures that teach us about this event we call the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, notice verse 13, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Paul is addressing the Thessalonian church who had had believers in their midst who died. We don't know if they died from persecution, if they'd been martyred, or if they just died of old age, or if they died of sickness. But from within that baby church, and this is a brand new church, some people had died. And so the question went back to the Apostle Paul. What happened to these people? Will we ever see these people again? Do these people have any hope of the future? And so Paul is answering that question. Don't grieve like the rest of mankind. Verse 14 we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, this term, fallen asleep, is a metaphor for death. And it's kind of a sweet and beautiful metaphor because when a Christian who is in Christ dies physically, Scripture uses the terminology of sleep because what, they're, what we're saying in that is this is temporary. This is not permanent. This is not dead forever and gone. This is just a temporary sleep. And the reason for that is because resurrection is going to awaken every believer who has died in the Lord. Verse 15, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Surely this is one of the sweetest passages in all of the Bible. So let me be clear first off. When it comes to this event that we call the rapture, there is no debate about whether it will happen or not. Last week we learned about the millennium and how theologians debate as to whether there is a literal thousand year period. There should be no debate about this. The rapture is an event that will happen. It's been promised numerous times in Scripture, and the promise is this. First off, 
dead saints, those people who we've, we've read have fallen asleep, they will be resurrected. So just stop for a moment and think of someone you know who was a follower of Jesus, who you've lost, someone who's died. Maybe someone for you, it's, maybe it's recent. For me, I'll always think of my grandpa Goodkey, who died in 1995, faithful Christian man. And uh, many of us can think of many people. Many of us have lost our parents, and we, maybe we've lost children who were followers of Jesus. And we have this tremendous hope that we will see them again, that life is not over. In fact, we would, we would believe from Scripture that their soul has already gone to be with Jesus in heaven. This event is the reuniting of their soul and their body. Not only the reuniting of their soul and body, but the reuniting of them and us. When we are caught up, and that's what the word rapture means, when living believers are caught up to be with Jesus, those loved ones we've lost who are followers of Jesus will already be clustered around him. And when we see him, we will see them. What a hope we have. Secondly, as I said, the word rapture, it's actually a Latin word. It's not found in the Bible, but it's a Latin word that means to be caught up. It's a word, an expression that we found here in our passage here. Uh, living Christians will meet the Lord in the sky. We will be caught up, yes, yeah, supernaturally. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we find that it's not just a matter of us being caught up, but our bodies are going to be changed. Some of you are familiar with that passage. In fact, I believe uh, our speaker these next two Sundays is going to be addressing that passage. So you'll be learning more about that. When we are caught up to be with Jesus, our bodies are changed or glorified, we could say, so that we become like Jesus or our physical bodies will become like the body of Jesus. And what was the body of Jesus like after he rose from the dead? It was amazing. Still physical, and yet he could move through walls, he could just walk through doors, he could just appear, he could show up wherever he wanted to, but he could still eat. You've heard me say that before, I love that part. <laughs> Walks through the door, just shows up, just appears. We would think, well, that sounds like a spiritual body. And then he says, what do you got to eat? Or like when he showed up on the Sea of Galilee and had breakfast cooking there and said, Peter, bring some of those fish. Somehow the glorified body is both a physical and spiritual body. Somehow those two things unite it. Never think that our eternal body or our, our eternal existence when we are with Jesus forever and ever will be, will be like a ghost, will be like a vapor, will float around on clouds and play harps and eat Philadelphia cream cheese. We're going to be people. We're still going to be humans. We're still going to have bodies, glorified bodies. And that's the promise that is coming to us in the rapture. And then we find that we meet the Lord in the air. We will see him. We will be in his presence. And the promise continues that having uh, experience this event and being caught up into the presence of Jesus, we will be with the Lord forever. So in other words, where Jesus goes from that moment on, so we go. From that moment on, wherever Jesus is, we are. And when Jesus returns to the earth in judgment, we will be with him. When Jesus sets up a millennial kingdom, we will be with him. When Jesus ushers in the eternal kingdom, the eternal state, we will be with him based on the promise of God's word forever. This is what we look forward to. Now, the challenge is, and those of you who are students of, uh, of this theology and you've tried to discern, well, when does the rapture happen? John Darby and many, many since him, many today, believe that the, the rapture happens before the tribulation. It happens as a separate event from the Lord's second coming to the earth. Uh, regardless, though, we, we place the rapture either before an event called the tribulation, some place it after. So let me just show you some of the promises of Scripture about this period 
we call the tribulation. Daniel 12, 1. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. I'm showing you here that this teaching about a tribulation period at the end of time is all through Scripture. Jesus talked about it in three of the Gospels. There will be a great distress, unequaled, from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, or God's people, those days will be shortened. And then in 2 Timothy 3, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, there will be terrible times in the last days. And then in Revelation, there is a scene depicted of, of many, many people who are singing and worshiping God. And as we see here, dressed in white robes. And the Apostle John, who's writing Revelation, uh, asks the question, having seen this vision, who are these people? And the answer is, these are they who've come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So we have so much to look forward to. We've got the good news and the bad news. There is a time coming on the earth when there will be a great tribulation. But there is also this promise of a rapture. So I want to show you this, and this is probably way too small, but if you can see it. What I'm doing here is just showing you a very basic timeline. This is not nearly as, uh, as detailed as some outlines or timelines that are used in end times teaching, but this is the basic one. And it starts with what I've called the current age. This is the moment we're in right now. And sometime in the future, there is a time of tribulation, uh, possibly seven years, th uh, three and a half years, depending on your understanding of, of the prophecies. After the tribulation, we have the return of Christ to the earth. And then as we saw last week, we believe there will be a thousand year millennial kingdom. And after that kingdom is when the final judgment takes place. You may have heard of the great white throne judgment of uh, Revelation chapter 19. And then after that is what I've called the eternal kingdom. And we'll be talking about that in our last message on Labor Day Sunday. So the question is, where do we put the rapture in this? We know the rapture is going to happen. It's an event that's spoken of multiple times in Scripture. And John Darby and many others, as I've said since, including now, place the rapture before the tribulation. It is an event, it's believed, that takes place separately from the return of Christ. Most would say the tribulation period is this period of seven years so the rapture happens, which means all of the living believers in the world are caught away. And then that seven-year tribulation period begins. And at the end of that period is the return of Christ. Others place the rapture as something that happens when Jesus returns. It's part of that. It's part of his return. So in other words, meeting the Lord in the air means that He's coming to the earth, and before he gets here, we join him. Uh, and I know that might seem strange to some of us, but the imagery is the idea of a conquering king who's been out at war, and he's coming back home. And when we hear the shout that the king is coming, we all rush out to meet him and join the procession and the entourage as he returns back into the city. Uh, so that would be the imagery of the post tribulation rapture. And uh, as I've said, I understand that many people have different views on this. Actually, some people even place the rapture in the middle of the tribulation, sometimes called the mid-trib rapture or pre-wrath. Um, I want to take some time to think about the pre-tribulation rapture and why did John Darby believe this? Why did he put this idea forward? And why have many since him believed in this, including many of you here, so what is the biblical reason for a pre-tribulation rapture? By the way, I am assuming that we are all Bible students, aren't we? That as we come to the Bible, in fact, as followers of Jesus, I've said this many times at Wallenstein, we want to know what Jesus knows and we want to live as Jesus lives. So to be a follower of Jesus is to be a student of the Bible, right? That's just who we are. We take these things seriously. And to be a student of the Bible means that we study the Bible to see what it says, and we believe what it says. 
we are looking to understand the evidence, the biblical evidence, and we make convictions and we form our beliefs based on what we find in God's Word. That's the assumption that I make. In fact, we need to take that seriously because one of the very last verses of the Bible at the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, right before it talks about the coming of Jesus, it says this, anyone who adds to the words of this prophecy, the book of Revelation, will have all of the curses of this prophecy poured out upon them, paraphrasing. In other words, it's a very strong challenge at the end of God's word that we don't add to or take away from God's Word. In other words, to be students of the Bible is to have a very serious endeavor before us, where we look at the evidence that the Bible gives us, and we follow it where it leads. And when the evidence of Scripture and what we find in Scripture is different than what I've believed or what I thought, whether it's about God or about myself or about the world or about the future, my will bends towards the Word of God, because it's His Word. It's His revelation to me. That's a really important thing for us to remember. The other thing I want us to remember is that when it comes to Scripture, we have two things. We have certainty, and we have, can you guess? Mystery. There is certainty, and there is mystery. There are things, and I've expressed it already in this teaching about the rapture. Let's not argue about whether the rapture is going to happen. Let's not go home today and think, well, I'm not so sure whether that's actually going to happen. No, it's going to happen because it's promised in the Word of God. We can be certain about it. We should be willing to argue for it graciously. But we believe that it's going to happen. Certainty. We can be certain that Jesus is the Son of God. We can be certain that Jesus gave his life as a substitutionary atonement so that we could be forgiven and saved. We can argue, we can die. We should die for those kinds of certain theological truths. We should. But then, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are mystery. And we ask ourselves, well, why did God make it that way? You know, one example I thought of recently is in the early chapters of the Bible, we read, this strange story about uh, something called the, the sons of men and the sons of God. And the sons of God went into the sons of men and had children, and they were giants. And people debate, like, okay, so are these angels? The angels uh, had relations with humans and produced... Like, what? Folks, that's not something we're going to argue and die for. There's so much mystery in that, and there's views, various views of that. Why is the Bible written in such a way that on certain topics and issues, we just don't have solid answers? Why is that? Here's what I believe. Remember what Jesus said when he talked about the kind of faith that saves us. He was very clear about this. He taught this to his disciples, and he said this, unless you have faith like a child, faith like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is childlike faith? Childlike faith is faith that is built on the certainty of the Father's love and of the Father's presence, but it's willing to endure the mystery of unanswered questions. I was thinking this morning about uh, one or two times when I was a little kid, and I've seen this happen since, where, you know, after Sunday service, and back in those days, everybody had a black suit on, and, and, and dad's standing around with some other men, and they're talking about various things, and I go and stand beside the wrong guy, and I'm, I grab his hand, or I grab his pants, and then I look up and realize, that ain't my dad. And so what do we do? sheepishly, probably cried knowing me, but walk across the circle, find my dad. I want to hold his hand. But then I remember as a young boy, my dad was, was a pretty good mechanic and he was into cars. And I remember asking him one time, dad, how does an engine work? And he did his best to explain to me how an engine worked. I didn't, I still don't get it. But I trusted him. And actually what I trusted is that he knows 
how an engine works, and actually he seems to be able to fix it when it breaks. That's my dad. He can do that. Or when my dad had an old snow machine, he had an old motorcycle, and when he said, come on, let's, let's go for a ride, and I'm holding on to those handlebars, and I don't know how he's balancing that thing, but I trust my dad. That is built into the faith. And I think we wrongly, as Bible students, try to eradicate any mystery. We want to explain everything. We want to be able to give an answer for everything. And we eradicate all the mystery. And we're no longer being children of faith, trusting a father who knows a whole bunch of stuff we don't know. And I find that when we do that, we inevitably embrace a conviction that seems to fit with one scripture, but violates another. And that's why this is challenging. We want to be sincere and honest Bible students. We want to see what it says. So why do people believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, including many of you? Uh, here's the first one. is the idea, the scriptural idea that's taught throughout the Bible that Jesus could return at any time. If Jesus can return at any time, and we're going to see, we don't know when, then how could it come at the end of a tribulation that it seems will be quite evident and obvious? So if Jesus comes at any time, wouldn't it have to be before those things happen? Matthew 24, 42 to 44, keep watch. You don't know on what day your Lord will come, but understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And then uh, Mark 13. About that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, even Jesus. Notice there was mystery even for him about the timing of his coming. Only the Father knows. Be on your guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the word of God. Matthew 25 is the story of those, um, those ladies that have the lanterns, and there's a wedding that's about to happen, but they don't know when the bridegroom's going to come, and some of them bring extra oil, and some of them don't, and the bridegroom comes at a time when they're not ready, and uh, some of those people with the lamps run out of oil, and their lamps go out. And the moral of the story, Matthew 25, 13, is keep watch. You do not know the day or the hour. Romans 13, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. And Titus 2, 13, we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And James 5, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. The judge is standing at the door. So, the primary reason that people believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is the teaching throughout Scripture. We saw it from Jesus, we see it from Paul and even James here, that the, the return of Jesus or the coming of Jesus could happen at any moment. And so the thought process is, well, if he could come at any moment, then could it really be after that seven-year tribulation, which seems to be described as something that will be obvious and known. So that's the first point. The second major point in terms of the pre-tribulation rapture, a scriptural reason that people would hold to, are verses that seem to suggest that God's people will escape his wrath. Two examples from 1 Thessalonians, first in chapter 1, uh, Paul writing to the Thessalonian church, he says, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. And then same book, chapter 5, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a, as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's one other verse. It comes from Revelation chapter 3. Uh, these are the seven letters written to seven churches, written from Jesus or sent from Jesus to these churches. And here's the letter uh, that's written to the church of Philadelphia. 
Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. It comes from the letter written to the Church of Philadelphia. These are the strongest, I would argue, the strongest evidences for a pre-tribulation rapture, and there are, there are many others that people would point to. Now, I grew up in the Brethren movement. I grew up under the teachings that originated with John Darby. I had a Schofield Bible, which was all about the dispensations that Darby had taught. And I was taught and understood a pre-tribulation rapture. So now, full disclosure, as I have read the Bible, as I've gotten older, there are a number of questions that have arisen in my mind as to whether this fits the biblical doctrine. Now, so let me say again, and I said this last week, uh, a number of our elders here would hold to the conviction of a pre-tribulation rapture, but they hold to it um, with a humility, uh, without dogmatism, uh, with, without the attitude that this is the way and the only way, they recognize there is an element of mystery. Some of us struggle, to be honest, more than that. And we wonder if it could be true based on some of the things that we find in the scripture. So I'm going to show you those things, not to try and convince you otherwise, but just to show you what I believe is mystery on this topic. So here are the questions that I would ask a pre-tribulationist. We saw those two verses in 1 Thessalonians, verses that seem to describe believers not coming under the wrath of God. But there's an interesting dynamic that happens in 2 Thessalonians, a letter that's clearly written after the first. And that is that the believers are concerned that the day of the Lord has already come. Why is that? Well, they're enduring persecution. And they're wondering if they're facing uh, not just the tribulation, but, but the judgment of God that comes after Jesus returns. So Paul writes to them to address that question. And here's my argument. If in 1 Thessalonians, Paul was telling the, the Thessalonians that they would be raptured before the tribulation, why wouldn't he just say so in his second letter when they were worried that they had missed the coming of the Lord? In other words, if, if they thought they'd missed the Lord's coming, all Paul has to say is, no, don't you understand? It's a pre-tribulation rapture. So whatever happens in the world, you're going to be gone before the tribulation comes and before Jesus returns in wrath. But that's not what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice what he says. Again, speaking to these believers who are troubled and they're being persecuted. He says, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. And notice now, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled. Now, we believe relief to the believer comes at the rapture. But notice he puts these two things together. Relief comes with payback, paying back trouble to those who trouble you and giving relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. And then he tells us when it's going to happen. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not obey God, who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day, he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Now, we would believe that we're going to be glorified in Christ and we're going to marvel at Jesus when we're raptured, when we see him. This passage says, I don't know how you could argue it, that that is the same day as the day of Christ's return and judgment on the world. Same thing happens in second, the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Here he's addressing their concerns concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered to him. Do you see how he puts those two things together? We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by a word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. We think of this person as the Antichrist. That's part of the tribulation. But again, notice what he says there concerning the coming of our Lord and our being gathered to him. 
He says, don't be alarmed. You haven't missed it. It's yet to come. And his explanation isn't that the gathering happens before the man of lawlessness is revealed and the Lord's day comes after. He doesn't say that. In this case, he puts them together. Another question for pre-tribulationists. If the letter to the church of Philadelphia, I mentioned that scripture, Revelation 3.10, is a promise to the universal church, why don't we expect that the promises in the other letters are for us as well? So it, the argument is simple here. Revelation 3.10 is a letter that Jesus wrote to a specific church in a specific time, thousands of years ago. We, if we are pre-tribulationists, we tend to take that letter and say, no, this is for us. This is a promise for us. This must mean that we're going to be raptured before the tribulation. So my simple question is, why do we do that with that verse and with that letter, but not with any of the others, including the letter to the church of Smyrna, exactly one chapter earlier in verse 10, which says, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Now, nobody goes to that letter and that verse and says, well, this is part of our future. But why do we do that with the letter to the church of Philadelphia? Question three. I just have two more. If the rapture happens before the tribulation, why is the description of Christ's second coming after the tribulation so similar to the descriptions of the rapture? Now, if you know 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, uh, you, you might remember that Jesus comes in the clouds and uh, there's the, the voice of the archangel and then there's trumpets and we're caught up to him. But notice the description Jesus gives of his second coming. This is his return to the earth. We know that because it says there, all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Now, when I just read this honestly, that sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. And then more specifically, more specifically, and I guess I didn't include this, or did I? More specifically, I guess I only have three. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that the rapture happens at the last trumpet. Right? It's pretty clear, 1 Corinthians 15, it's the last trumpet. But if we believe that rapture happens before the tribulation and Jesus comes back after the tribulation with the sound of the trumpet, then I just have a, a bit of an issue putting all of that together. So those are questions that I would ask for a pre-tribulationist. Does that mean uh, that I've made up my mind, that I know the timing of the rapture? Actually, I don't. And I think both sides of this argument are very compelling. Jesus teaching us to be watchful, expect his coming at any time. And then these verses that, in my opinion, seem to show that the rapture is going to happen when Jesus comes again to the earth. For me, there's a mystery here. And I'm not able to be dogmatic and say it's this way or it's that way. There's some things, though, that need to be true of us as we prepare for the Lord's return. This is the important part. What does the rapture teaching teach us? What does the teaching of the Lord's return teach us? What is the point of all that Jesus and Paul and Peter and James wrote in terms of the end times? Number one, joyful anticipation. Joyful anticipation. Now that's hard to do if we, and I know some of you are thinking, well, if we have to go through the tribulation, how am I supposed to possibly have joyful anticipation? Well, Jesus is the example first example of how we can have joyful anticipation, even though times may be difficult in the future. Because Hebrews tells us, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Paul is an example of someone who had joyful anticipation, even though he was a man who knew, who had this very real sense that he was about to be martyred. Peter could have joyful anticipation and anticipate the coming of the Lord, even though Jesus told him in John 21 
that someday when he's old, he's going to stretch out his arms and people will lift him up and carry him where he doesn't want to go. That was a reference to the fact that he would be crucified. Peter was crucified upside down. And yet all of these men could show us that we can have true, joyful anticipation, excitement of what is to come. In fact, we can endure the difficulties of this life now, even the difficulties we have today, because of the promises that we have for future redemption, salvation, and being with Jesus. Now, I know the difficulty of this because I've spent a lot of my life uh, hoping hoping that Jesus doesn't come back too soon because there's some things I want to do and some things I want to experience. And if that's you today, then I would just urge you and encourage you that, that we can pray, and we can open our Bibles every day, and we can say this, Lord, I want to anticipate Jesus more than anything else. So would you open my eyes to see his beauty and his glory so that I long to see him more than anything else? That's what we can do. That is one of those prayers that if we pray sincerely and we put the work in, God will answer. God can give us a heart of excitement and joy and anticipation if we would sincerely seek it from him. So that's the first thing. Jesus said, be watchful. Anticipate. We should live as though Jesus is coming back at any moment. If we believe that, we will live more faithfully for Jesus. But then number two, and this is the teaching we've seen all through our series, that when the Bible speaks about the end times, it is seeking to instill courage and endurance in the people of God. Not a sense that everything's going to be fine for us. We're going to escape all the hard stuff. Many of us would say we have escaped a lot of stuff in our culture in North America. But folks, there are Christians around the world, in Iran, in Afghanistan, in North Korea, who would have no sense to ever believe in a pre-tribulation rapture because they're living the tribulation now. They would have no concept that they're going to escape this terrible tribulation that's to come because they're living in a terrible tribulation now. Not the tribulation, I'm not saying that, but they're experiencing even martyrdom and death right now. We need to have that kind of courage and endurance. This is what Jesus wants for us. This is what the Apostle Paul would want for us. This is what the Word of God builds in us. And regardless of whether we are taken before the tribulation or not, to be faithful to Jesus now means I'm willing to do hard things and I'm willing to experience hard things. I'm willing to be bold in my faith. I'm going to tell people about Jesus, even if it means that I don't get that promotion uh, or, or uh, people reject me as friends. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going to be faithful to him first. And we need that kind of courageous endurance. This is what the word of God calls us to. And as I've looked at these end time passages again and again, this is what it is calling out of us. Be courageous and endure. And you're sitting here today, like so often I have in my life saying, I don't have that. I don't feel courage. I don't want to endure. I don't want to face hard things. And I would say the very same thing I said a few moments ago, open your Bible and open your heart to God and say, Lord Jesus, I don't have courage. I'm afraid to face hardship in my life. Yeah, I know you went to the cross, but I don't want a cross. I know you called me to take up my cross and follow you, but I want it, I want it easy. And Lord Jesus, I want to be faithful to you. I want to be faithful to your calling. Would you build courage in me? Would you build endurance in me? You pray that kind of prayer sincerely, you open the word of God, you put in the work, you hear what it says, you trust, you believe what it says, and God will build courage and endurance in you. By the way, notice what I'm saying here. Don't pray a prayer and hope that it happens by osmosis. Get into the word. The word is what builds that kind of faith and courage and endurance and joy in our lives. Finally, this one. Humble conviction. I know some of you are sitting here today. You believe strongly and firmly in the pre-tribulation rapture. 
First thing I would say is, are your convictions rooted in the word of God? Some of you perhaps believe in a post-tribulation rapture. And I would say, are your convictions rooted in the word of God? It is not wrong for us to have a conviction or an opinion about the timing of these things. There are scriptural reasons to believe on both sides. It's not wrong to have a conviction. My challenge for us is that we would hold those convictions humbly. I think as you get to know me, as you hear me preach, you will find that there are things that I'm going to get, I'm going to raise my voice about and I'm going to be excited about and we're going to die on this hill. But then you'll find there's many other things that are a mystery, that aren't necessarily clear and obvious in the Bible. And the right way for us to behave as brothers and sisters is with humility. In other words, it's possible that we could stand before Jesus one day and he might say this to us, you know that rapture thing? You nailed it. You figured it out. Good for you. But I've got one thing against you. You divided my church. You slandered my people. And that was wrong. It is possible in these types of discussions and arguments to be right, but to be oh so wrong. And on these matters, matters in which we don't die on every hill, we do not divide and split the church of God in order to insist that we're right. So we hold these things with humble conviction. And we walk together as the elders of this church are with humble unity. It's a beautiful unity. Even though we may not see all of these things exactly the same, but we walk together in love, in unity, wanting first of all that Jesus would be known and that his people would be built up. This is what we need. Joyful anticipation, courageous endurance, humble conviction. May it be so. Let's sing. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word, for this call of your word that we would follow Jesus and that we would take up a cross, not a cross of salvation and redemption. He was the only one that could carry that cross. But now you've called us to take up a cross, a cross that has us laying down our lives for the sake of one another and for the world around us. Forgive us, Father, for how we have sought out ease and comfort. We have expected no less. I pray, Father, you'd stir in our hearts today a readiness to do hard things, to endure hardship, all the while joyfully anticipating the promise of your coming, of being caught up to be with Jesus and to be with loved ones, all while learning to be courageous, to have courageous endurance, and while we learn to have humble convictions, Lord. We live in a world that so desperately needs Jesus, just as we did. I pray that we'd leave here today with hearts that are on fire to win some, to win someone else. Would you go before us, Lord? Would you make us faithful to you, to your word, and to your calling? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated.